Of the Daedra's legendary artifacts, many are well known, like Azura's Star and Sheagorath's Wabajak. Others are less well known, like Scourge, Makan's Hammer, Bane of Daedra. Yet though Malakath blessed Scourge to be potent against his Daedra kin, he thought not that it should fall into Daedric hands, then to serve as a tool for private war among Caitiff and Forsaken. Thus did Malakath curse the device, such that, should any dark kin seek to invoke its powers, that a void should open and swallow that Daedra, and purge him into Oblivion's void streams, from thence to Parfine back to the real and unreal worlds in the full order of time. Daedric artifacts are not merely objects. They may look like weapons, armor, and trinkets on the surface, but the creators of these relics are fond of tricks and taints, giving these artifacts quirks and unique qualities. It's almost as if they achieve autonomy, developing personalities, choosing for themselves how to manifest, and how to act in the mortal realm of Mundus. Could this be possible? Can an object influence the world around it? It is said that the Daedra Lords cannot create, only imitate, exaggerate, and corrupt, and their artifacts display these traits. They are like objects from the mortal realm, but they are embellished and profane, even if they appear at first like the ultimate prize. Hey guys, it's Drew the Daedrologist here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Today we're not going to be talking about the princes, nor the lesser races, but instead the artifacts forged by the Lords of Oblivion. Their realm is Chaos Incarnate, and the deities who rule the many planes are tyrants at best, and slave masters or torturers at worst. Their planes are ever-changing, and as we'll discover in this video, so too are their artifacts. Unsurprisingly, their most valuable relics are as likely to cause trouble as they are to benefit their beholders. So, in this video, we're going to delve into the lore of some of the Daedric artifacts known to change their appearance and their properties, and we'll discuss the true nature of these curious treasures. Let's dive right in with the artifacts of our illustrious Lady of Dawn and Dusk, Azura. Listed below are some of the more storied items found throughout Tamrielic lore. The existence of some has been proven, while others may simply be the stuff of legend. Regardless, these items have found their way into the tales we tell our children, and our children will tell their children. The first of these storied items is Azura's Star. This artifact is one that lacks an obvious practical purpose. It is vaguely reminiscent of a throwing star, but to use Azura's star for such a purpose would not only be impractical, but would also be blasphemy, like using the Holy Grail as a chamber pot. Azura's star wielded by the right person is invaluable, serving as a receptacle for souls that can be used indefinitely. Ironically, Azura's star is fundamentally different to most Daedric artifacts. The common theme is that Daedric artifacts are corrupted imitations of real-world items. However, with Azura's star, it is mortals who corrupted the artifact. A Dunma sorcerer named Malin Varen discovered a way to allow the star to accept black souls, transforming it into the black star. He then used it to preserve his soul and achieve immortality when his mortal body died. Curiously, this artifact has manifested on Tamriel in many different ways, and I'm not just referring to the darker colour of the corrupted black star. In Daggerfall during the 405th year of the Third Era, it looks like a pale blue crystal, only vaguely star-shaped. In this form, it looks more like the inside of the star when we see it in the Fourth Era Skyrim. During the 427th year of the Third Era, the star appears in Morrowind, and features straight sharp edges with spiralling silver on black patterns wrought into the surface. When it appeared in Cyrodiil it was dark as onyx, and the eight pronged edges were curved. In Fourth Era Skyrim it is less sharp and inlaid with pale blue gemstones. The changes in the star's appearance can hardly be explained by the graphics of each installment of the Elder Scrolls. They are made from different materials and stylistically look nothing like their other renditions. The Ebony Mail is another example. The Ebony Mail is a breastplate created before recorded history by the Dark Elven Goddess Boethia. It is she who determines who should possess the Ebony Mail and for how long a time. If judged worthy, its power grants the wearer added resistance of fire, magicka, and grants a magical shield. It is Boethia alone who determines when a person is ineligible to bear the Ebony Mail any longer, and the Goddess can be very capricious. The Ebony Mail is relatively consistent in its multiple manifestations, however, it sometimes appears as a full set of armour, while other times just a breastplate. 
The ebony mail is a perfect example of an artifact that changes in more than just appearance. The most notable aspect of the breastplate is its magical effect. Typically, like when it appeared in High Rock, Black Marsh, and Morrowind, the mail guarded the wearer from fire damage, magicka damage, and improved the wearer's defenses. In Fourth Era Skyrim, however, the mail had none of these traits. Instead, it allowed the wearer to move quietly, and it radiated a noxious purple aura, which would poison anyone who came too close. Anyone with experience in smithing and enchanting knows that it is not an easy task to remove enchantments from items to replace with new ones. In fact, most mortals would consider it impossible, unless you wish to destroy the item altogether. Yet the Daedric artifacts defy mortal limitations once again in this regard. A case could be made that the artifacts adjust to the needs of the wielder, or even to the impulses of the prince at the time. When the mail appears in Morrowind, it provides fire resistance. It may be a coincidence, but the relic can be found in the Molag Amur region, where pools of lava occupy every hollow of the volcanic rock, and ash rains almost constantly. Whereas in Skyrim, Boethia commands the last dragonborn to kill her previous champion silently. The reward? The ebony mail complete with a stealth effect. Like Azura's star and Boethia's mail, Clavicus Vile's most well-known artifact varies in style across depictions. The mask of Clavicus Vile is a full helm, depicting a horned and bearded man's face. However, when it surfaced in High Rock, the mask did not sport horns or a beard. And in Skyrim, the face is less human, and styled with spikes and swirls. Like the Ebony Mail, the mask is known to vary slightly in effect too. However, I won't go into much detail on this, as I'd argue this is one of those instances where differences can be chalked up to game mechanics and not lore. In Daggerfall, the mask improves reputation. In Morrowind and Cyrodiil, it boosts personality. But in Skyrim, it actually ups bartering, persuasion, and magicka regen. See what I mean? The Ebony Mail's change in attributes is pretty substantial whereas for the mask, the difference between reputation, personality, bartering, and persuasion mostly comes down to the mechanics of the game. But enough of the fourth wall breaking, another of Vile's artifacts has a much more interesting history of changing forms, and that is the sword named Umbra. The Umbra sword was enchanted by the ancient witch Nainra Ware, and its sole purpose was the entrapment of souls. Used in conjunction with a soul gem, the sword allows the wielder the opportunity to imprison an enemy's soul in the gem. It is believed Nainra Ware was actually Sheergoroth in disguise, as the sword consumed a piece of Clavigus Vile's power in its creation. This piece of power used to stabilize the sword became sentient and called itself Umbra. Nainra was executed for her evil creation, but not before she was able to hide the sword. The Umbra sword is very choosy when it comes to owners, and therefore remains hidden until a worthy one is found. It has been reported as a black and silver claymore, a jet black longsword, and as a black sword emblazoned with red markings. But Umbra took another form that's considerably more unique, and it's called Umbriel. The Umbra Sword changed hands a couple of times, before returning to the possession of its master, Clavicus Vile. But Umbra took the first possible opportunity to escape once inside Vile's realm, and also cut away yet more of Clavicus's power. With this additional power, Umbra could manifest as something greater than a sword. It took the form of a dark being, shaped like a man but defiled, with eyes like holes into nothing. The prince pursued Umbra, but his artifact was cunning and evaded him. Umbra learned about a device called an Ingenium, which could use the power of souls as a fuel source. It was an Ingenium that allowed the Ministry of Truth to remain suspended in the air above Vivek City. Umbra took the creators of the Ingenium captive in Vile's realm and struck a deal with them, trading their lives for a new Ingenium which would tear a piece of Vile's realm to become the property of Umbra. Umbra's soul became fused with the Ingenium that powered the floating city of Umbriel. With Umbra emancipated from the sword, it was unstable and drove any wielders insane. The artifact was seemingly destroyed at the end of the events of the Infernal City novel. However, almost 140 years later, in the 179th year of the Fourth Era, the sword reappeared on Tamriel. The sword would eventually end up in the hands of the last dragonborn. This piece of lore was introduced in order to sell the sword on Creation Club, so it does feel a little bit forced. And we can't explicitly say Creation Club is canon, but regardless of whether it was destroyed or not, Umbra is a fascinating artifact, showing the ambition and wit to rival its creator. Malakath's two main artifacts are highly sought after by Tamriel's greatest warriors. Scourge is the bane of Daedra, forged from sacred ebony in the fires of Fickledor. 
it can be used to banish the Hordes of Oblivion back to the Void. The origins of his second main artifact, Volundrung, is somewhat less clear. The legends say that Volundrung, also known as the Hammer of Might, was actually forged by the Dwemer, specifically the Rorkan clan of Dwarves. It is described as a large ebony warhammer, though the book titled Modern Heretics claims otherwise, saying it's actually a sword. Due to the nature of Daedric artifacts, we can't prove this source wrong. However, Volundrung has been sighted several times over the eras, each time looking distinctly like a hammer. There's also the fact that the dwarven word Volan literally translates to hammer, and is the namesake for the province of Volanfell, or Hammerfell, as it is known in modern times. Until the disappearance of the Dwemer in the 700th year of the First Era, Volandrung was kept by the Dwarves, originally wielded by the chieftain of the Rorkan clan. After their disappearance, the hammer somehow came into Malakath's possession, and nowadays the hammer is more commonly associated with him than it is with its original creators. Volandrung is a perfect example of the changing nature of Daedric artifacts. When the hammer appeared in Third Era Morrowind and Cyrodiil, it looked very much like its initial description, a huge warhammer forged from ebony. This rare volcanic glass is mostly found deep underground in the Vardenfell region. Coincidentally, this was also a location inhabited by a large population of dwarves before their disappearance. In the Hammer's most recent appearance on Tamriel, however, in the fourth era Skyrim, it looks wildly different. It is sharp and jagged, sporting many of the aesthetic stylings of Daedric weapons. But some would argue it looks more like orcish arms and armor, with its slight dark green coloration and curved spikes. It remains made from ebony and not from Orichalcum, but nevertheless there's no denying the fact that Malakath's appropriation of the hammer has altered its physical appearance. And in the most recent depiction, it looks far more fitting in the hands of an orc than it would in the hands of a dwarf. Its magical effects are just as prone to changing, as it has been known to appear to mortals without any effect at all in some cases, while in others it heals the wielder. In most cases though, it paralyzes foes and saps their vitality. So like Volundrung, there are some artifacts that seem to adapt to their forms to suit their beholders. But what about artifacts that change to suit particular purposes? Well, there are a few more practical than the Mistress of Shadows Nocturnal. One of her artifacts, the Skeleton Key, is explicitly documented for its ability to shift shape between a key and a lockpick, a feat that would be considered unfathomable for a regular object. In key form, it could unlock any lock without exception, and in lockpick form, well, it could pick any lock without exception and is unbreakable. Unless there's something about this shape-shifting ability we mortals don't understand that I'm clearly missing, it would seem to me that the key has no need to manifest as a lockpick if it can already unlock any lock it sees. I'll chalk that one up to the mysterious nature of Nocturnal and the Lords of Oblivion. Either way, the skeleton key that emerged in Third Era Morrowind and Cyrodiil was certainly a lockpick, while in Fourth Era Skyrim and Third Era High Rock, it was without a doubt key-shaped. You'd think that the capabilities of this artifact wouldn't be subject to much change. After all, it's a master key. You're not going to be using it for any other purpose, right? Well, that's mostly right, as each time the artifact is manifested, its main effect is some form of lockpicking enhancement, or ability to open locks without the necessary skill or the correct key. The first exception, though, is in High Rock, when the key also granted the owner a boost in agility, allowing them to dodge attacks better. The more noteworthy side effect of this key is arguably there in every manifestation, though mortals rarely have the knowledge to tap its power. The skeleton key opens more than just physical locks. It can open the pathway to Nocturnal's Everglome. It can unlock portals, hidden potential, and all things known and unknown. But even a Daedrologist couldn't tell you exactly what is meant by this. It would seem that just like its creator, the skeleton key is shrouded in mystery, not meant for mortal minds to decipher. As is often the case when I study the Daedra Lords, there is one, or you could say two, princes whom I always end up having to leave until last. They love to make topics like this complicated. They force me to speculate a touch, and they always throw a spanner in the works. I'm referring to the Daedric princes Sheergoroth and Jigalag. If you saw my video on the Prince of Order Jigalag, you may remember me talking about his one and only artifact, the aptly named Sword of Jigalag. At surface level, there's not much to say about this weapon. Its physical appearance is as consistent as its master. It is a giant claymore, made of a silver crystalline material, likely the same material as his Knights of Order, and it is entirely no-nonsense, with no enchantments or tricks. 
simply an edge sharp enough to cleave through the entire population of the Shivering Isles. With the exception of his brief grey march at the end of every era, Jigalag is cursed to live as the embodiment of everything he hates. His order crumbles away every time he retakes his throne, and he becomes the babbling loon Shiagora for yet another era. What happens to his sword in these times? Well, prior to being freed from his curse by the champion of Cyrodiil, all traces of Jigalag and his sword would vanish. We know Jigalag doesn't disappear, we know he becomes Shiagorath, so perhaps his sword doesn't disappear either. Maybe it becomes the staff of Shiagorath, the artifact's antithesis. When the Grey March begins, Shiagorath disappears and Jigalag arrives. Similarly, when Jigalag arrives with his sword, Shiagorath's staff loses all power, becoming a useless twig for the duration of the march. The connection between these two artifacts is as clear as Jigalag's perfect order, and I believe these artifacts are one and the same, just like the princes who wield them. That is until the gods' official separation after the Grey March is broken, Jigalag is freed and the champion of Cyrodiil mantles Shiagorath. And this is where we can draw some conclusions about the nature of Daedric artifacts. There is no doubt at all that these relics are nothing like the typical mundane objects found in the mortal realm. And I also think it would be an understatement to say they are simply extremely powerful items. Like their masters, there is much more to them than mortals can grasp. If we look at the princes themselves, we see them change their manifestations on a whim. This explains why they are genderless for a start. Mafala is notorious for meticulously plotting her appearance depending on the mortal she wishes to ensnare. And what about Shiagorath? Even when emancipated from his orderly counterpart Jigalag, we still see him meddling with his physical form to suit the circumstances. To the Khajiit of elsewhere, Shiagorath is Shegarath, or simply the Skooma Cat. For what is crazier than a cat on Skooma? And Shiagorath relishes in taking his role seriously, portraying himself as an Alphik, which is the breed of Khajiit that most closely resembles a house cat. When he appeared in Second Era elsewhere, he apparently faithfully portrayed cat-like tendencies, down to purring and chasing yarn. We acknowledge that Daedra Lords can appear in any way, shape or form, but I think we've seen enough over the eras in Tamriel that Daedric artifacts can do the same. Is it their princes responsible for altering them, or do they have agency of their own? We must also consider the possibility that the Daedric artifacts are likely part of the Daedric princes themselves, in the same way that their respective Oblivion realms are actually a part of them. Planes of Oblivion are entire realms created by the princes as a manifestation of their spheres and their personalities, and can be altered with little effort. Take Sanguine, the Lord of Indulgence. His myriad realms of revelry number over a hundred thousand, and each and every pocket realm is tailor-made to suit the desires of the visitor. If the Daedra Lords can transform their realms whenever it tickles their fancy, it's hardly a far-fetched theory to suggest the same of their artifacts. Whatever the answer may be, only a fool would consider a Daedric artifact to be an inanimate object. But that's all folks, there are a couple of artifacts which vary slightly across depictions that I chose to leave out, but that's because I felt their inclusion wasn't necessary to the theme of the video. I'm sure some of these variations can be explained away by developer design choices, and new improvements to graphical engines. The inhabitants of Oblivion don't follow the same rules as us mortals. Such was their imperative when they chose not to aid Lorcan in the creation of Mundus. And the same can be said for the artifacts of Oblivion, even if they can't speak for themselves. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.